How y'all doing? All right. All right. Does everybody understand English? Yeah. Okay. Does anybody not understand English? I know this is a crazy question. Okay. <laughs> What's the saying? So, all right. Well, I'm glad y'all are here. Uh, I'm from, from obviously, the United States. I live in Colorado. Uh, but I went to school in Texas for quite a bit, so I say y'all. So that's a Texas thing. That means all of you. So just so you know that. Uh, like I said, my name is Eric Johnson. I'll tell you a little bit about who I am and why I should be here. Um, I'm, a, I'm a senior developer advocate for service. I work for AWS. Uh, how many of y'all have heard of AWS or are familiar with it? Okay, how many of y'all are brand new to AWS never heard of it? That's okay. All right, uh, so AWS, Amazon Web Services, I do work for Amazon. Uh, we are a cloud provider. Uh, I am specific to serverless, and if you don't know what serverless means, that's okay. We're going to kind of climb into that a little bit. Uh, in fact, help me out. Anybody working with serverless now? Okay, that would be great. Most of you brand new to it. Okay. That's okay. Uh, we, we're going to kind of walk through uh, you know, what serverless looks like and what that is. So a little bit more, more about me. I'm, I'm big into serverless, obviously. I love tooling, uh, automation, things like that. I'm a geek about that. I'm a software architect. I'm a solutions uh, architect. I've done software, hardware, networking, you name it. Uh, I am a husband to my wife, Bridget. I have five kids. And I know that's not a five up there. I do realize that. Um, I will make one finger jokes today, so it's okay to laugh, it's okay to have fun. Come on in, I just got started. So, uh, yeah, grab a, grab a computer. Um, I uh, love music. I was a drummer. I, wasn't, I thought I was going to be a drummer for a living. Turns out I'm a really good drummer for one finger, but I'm fairly average in real life, so nobody's going to pay me to play. Um, and I love pizza and uh, Dr. Pepper, so those are, that's kind of my life. For logging in, all your information is right over here. Uh, to get logged in, one, one of course can help you out. A couple of things you're going to want to know today uh, as we're walking through number one. Uh, this is my Twitter handle. If you want to hear more about service after I leave, feel free to follow it. Uh, if you do Twitter, uh, also, uh, you know, I talk about family, I talk about pizza, I talk about all kinds of things. So it's good with the bad, you know. Uh, and then also, when we're, when we're working in our region today, you're going to have to choose a region. Right? The best one for us to work out is Frankfurt. It may not be the absolute closest, but it's the one that has all the services that we want to use in it. So Frankfurt's generally one of the first ones to get all the new services. So it's also known as EU East One. All right, so this is our agenda for today. Okay? Uh, and, and what I encourage you to do is I'm very relaxed. If you have a question, raise your hand. I may say, hey, let's answer the question. I may say, I'll come back to that. Uh, if you don't understand what I'm saying and you need to clarify something, let me know. Uh, you don't have to just be quiet and listen to me today. You're welcome. This is very interactive. I'm very casual. This is our uh, very loose agenda. We might go faster. We might go slower, depending on where you're at, since a lot of you have never seen serverless. I doubt we'll hit everything. This bottom one is in yellow because it's an iffy. If we get to it, we do it. If not, all of the workshops are available for you to do at home. You want to do them online at home? They're they're free. They, they, they're, they're well, they're free to you. You can use them. You can do whatever you want with them. Okay, so um, you'll be able to follow that up. But we will go through a couple workshops. So the basic format today is I'll be doing a lot of talking, uh, and there'll also be some self-driven workshops. So you spend a couple hours by yourself just going through it, and I'll be here to help. Uh, and then you'll uh, also be listening to me, and then we'll have some lunch and different things like that. All right. So, in order to get started, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to run a setup, okay? The setup that we're going to do today, so that, so that we're all on the same page, we're going to use an IDE called Cloud9. Now, if you're not familiar with an IDE, that's just it's, it's your developer environment, okay? So that's what we're going to use. Cloud9 is an online web-based environment that, that AWS offers, but we need to get it set up because sometimes... Uh, when a bunch of new uh, instances spin up, uh, AWS says, hey, we want to verify it. So it, you may get an error today saying, we need to verify it before we can launch this. So what I'm going to ask you to do is go to this URL, bitlywr-luxoft, and do exercise zero. Today we're going to do zero through 4B, and I'll explain that in a bit. 
But go ahead and do exercise zero. And that's going to take you about five, maybe ten minutes, and then we'll get into the session. Come on in. How are you? Welcome. I'll be walking around to help out if you have any questions on getting started. Make sure the web's good, the website came to the right place. All right, and you should all have, my understanding, they set you all up with, a, with an AWS account. All right. Uh, and if, do you all have Chrome on your machine? You should have Chrome. I would encourage you to use Chrome instead of Internet Explorer. It tends to work a little friendlier. All right, so let, let me find out a little bit about you guys real quick, and this will help me understand. I want to go around the room. How many of y'all are developers? Okay. All right, what, what else do you do? Tell me, what do you do? Yeah, I'm saying Ah, so it's like about Yeah. Raise your hand and ask. 
Don't be shy. Don't just stare at me if you don't understand. Get my attention and make me explain it better. Okay? Uh, I know that we might have a language barrier. I talk fast. I stumble over my words. Don't be shy to get my attention and say, hey, that doesn't make sense. Clear it up for me. All right. So when we talk about service, here's, here's, here's what we do at AWS. Here's how we define it. The first thing is uh, there's no infrastructure provision or management. All right, those of you who develop, tell me, tell me uh, we have some C sharp and .NET guys. Okay, Python, we use Django, things like that. Okay, I'm sorry. No, I'm just kidding, that's great. Java, Spring, different things like that. Okay, all right. So when you do this, where does your application reside? You spin up a server? Is it sitting in a server in your mom's closet? Where, where, where are your applications run? Now, you guys are running servers, so where does your application run? Cloud. Cloud, okay. So how do, how do you do it in the cloud? You spin up an instance? Virtual machine. Virtual machine, all right, okay. But that's an instance, right? Okay, what do you pay for? Don't, you don't have to tell me the numbers, but you pay for it. You're like, that's a little personal. Okay, uh, so you pay a monthly fee for that, right? Is it AWS? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So most of the time, when we run some type of application, we run it on a virtual machine, or a machine at home, or on our own machine, or in a machine in our mom's closet. You know what I mean? We have we are responsible for the machine, right? So when we want to build a new application, what do we do? We buy a new machine, or, or somehow get a machine, steal it from our neighbor, something. We install everything that we need on it, we install the frameworks, everything to serve it, we get it all up and running, then we're responsible for patching, security, all the things, right? Okay, with serverless, all of that is gone. You don't deal with any of that, okay? We usually, like, we have to run it, we have to set up a patch sheet, or we have to set up, you know, uh, I can't even do the job, so Tomcat or something like that. So is that old? Is Tomcat old? Uh, I'm not a Java developer. I tried Java for about two weeks, but I lost it. They just, so, so what with serverless, there's no infrastructure provisioning or management. It scales automatically. So let's let's talk about that. When you guys are running your application, I have seen machines that people are taping RAM to the sides and running processes on you because they, they're trying to handle the load that they're taking, right? So when you have to deal with large amounts of load in your VMs, you have to add more VMs, don't you? And you handle that through auto-scaling or you manually handle that. With serverless, it automatically happens. The more you need, the more you get. You don't ask for it, it just happens. Okay, so and we're going to talk about Lambda and what that means. But as you need more, as, as more people start hitting your site or, do, or hitting, doing whatever, it just scales up and more comes in and you never worry about it. Okay? Pay for value. You only pay for what you get or for what you use. So if I invoke, if my serverless Lambda is invoked 20 times in a day, I only pay for this. I don't pay for a server to sit up and run it. And you see the difference there? It's a big difference in how serverless relates to server full or server infrastructures. The cool thing about serverless on AWS is that when you run a Lambda, and a Lambda is kind of the compute idea of serverless, you get a million invokes a month for free. So if you're running a website that gets a million hits a month or less, you're going to come pretty close to free. Sounds pretty good for a startup, doesn't it? Okay? And finally, it's highly available and secure. So we build the infrastructure behind Lambda, behind serverless, that if, it, so, so our CTO is a guy by the name of Werner Bowles. And uh, he said this, and it's, it's gone all over the place, but he said, everything breaks all the time, right? The reality is we try to build infrastructure that won't break, that's not realistic. Better yet, we build infrastructure that degrades nicely or handles the break. Okay? So at AWS, if we, if the way we spread our infrastructure, if we lose a data center, 
the next data center can take over, and usually the customer doesn't even know that an entire data center can, can experience an interruption and, and not lose, and, and you, you still keep running. So we build that in. We also build in security. Okay? Now, did anybody work in an industry where they have to deal with compliance? PCI or HIPAA, those might be more of an American term, but okay, so you're dealing with kind of security what you're dealing with. What, uh, what, are, what are your regulations that you have to work with? Uh, PSI. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, so deal with some things. So our infrastructure meets most of those, or, or all of them, depending. In America, I'd say all of them, but yeah. Uh, it, it meets those regulations. Now, your app still has to be coded in a way that's secure. But as far as your infrastructure, you don't have to go to an auditor and go, well, oh, we did this for our infrastructure. You can just point them to us and we say, here's what we did. Okay? All right. So that's kind of how we define service. Any questions on this so far? All right. Good. All right. So what does this mean? So well, it means that, you know, you have greater agility, less operations, more product focus, faster time to market, and cost that grows with your business. So what does that mean by, by greater agility? As a developer, how many developers have to maintain their own infrastructure? You, do you maintain your own service? No, somebody else does? Okay, but somebody has to, right? Yeah. Okay, how about y'all? Anybody maintain their own service? Okay, all right, what about locally on your systems? Do you have to build your own Apache servers and your Tomcats and your Springs and things like that? Okay, so when you're developing, you have to maintain all that, right? Okay. What we found is that developers sometimes, especially in small companies, end up spending a lot of time building and maintaining networks and not developing. And companies that would take that away from the developers say, hey, you just do code, are much more agile, they can move much more faster, they can make decisions and, and apply things that work for the company uh, much faster. So, uh, cost that grows with your business, Again, as I was saying, because you only pay for what you use, you never pay for a server to sit out there and do nothing. Hey, I'm bored, I'm just sitting here. You only pay for the invocations, for the time that things happen. Okay? All right? All right, so this session is going to focus on the Lambda. Who knows what an AWS Lambda function is? Okay, some of you. All right, excellent. Okay, some of you don't. Good, I'm going to explain it, okay? You kind of get an idea of how serverless works. Okay, so with AWS Lambda, the service itself, we handle load balancing, auto scaling, failures, security, OS management, managing utilizations, and many other things for you. Okay, all you worry about is code. You don't worry about Apache, you don't worry about Nginx, you don't worry about Tomcat, you don't worry about F5, you don't worry about load balancer switches, all the things. Okay. All you worry about is code. We're going to handle everything on the back end for you. Okay, so let's look at serverless basics. We're going to talk about how the Lambda service, or Lambda works. So you have this Lambda, okay? I've created a Lambda, and I'm going to show you guys this in a minute. I've created a Lambda, and uh, he's sitting out there. He's ready to go. You're not paying for him. He's just, he's just in existence, okay? All right? He can be in Node, Python, Java, C Sharp, Go, Ruby, I think that almost covers all the languages. Anybody using a language that's, or runtime that's not up here? Anybody use Rust or R? PHP. PHP, all right, yeah, that's pretty common, yeah, the big one. Cool thing about Lambda is, if you don't have the language up here, you can create your own runtime through our runtime API, and actually someone's already created PHP. So, with our runtime API, we announced that last year, you're able to run any language you want, you have to create the runtime. It's actually pretty simple. We talked through it, but um, I say simple. I mean, depends on the language you run. We've had people do COBOL, Rust, R. Um, anybody use COBOL ever? Yeah, me neither. And, and, and the question was why, but they did it to prove they could do it. PowerShell, you see PowerShell? I did a Bash script one. I actually have a Lambda that does Bash. Okay, so you kind of get that idea. All right, so you have this Lambda function that you've created. Now, all Lambdas are driven or triggered by an event. That's very technical. 
Something has to happen. Okay? And when that thing happens, the lambda is triggered. Okay? So that, that can happen like a change in data state. Like I added something to DynamoDB or I added something to a database. It can happen in uh, request to endpoints, like uh, API Gateway. And, and I know I'm mentioning a lot of services. I'm going to clear those up a little bit better. API Gateway is our API front end that we need. But it, it could be like something dropped to file in the file storage. Anybody heard of S3 when I say Amazon or AWS S3? Okay. AWS S3 is the first service we came out with, came out in 2006, and it is an object level storage, meaning yeah. I was talking to Jeff while the demand that were generated by objects or by tangible. Yes. <laughs> Both. Both. It could be anything as an event. And that's a great question. Because it's been, Lambda can just really be generated. So let's let's say we have a scenario where we want a Lambda to watch a bucket, which is talking about a bucket. And let, let me finish, let me explain the S3 real quick and then I'm going to come back to this. S3 is an object level storage, meaning I don't have to say I need 6 gig, I need 10 gig, it just means I want to save this one thing on storage. And I have unlimited amounts of storage, okay? We have people storing petabytes in, in S3, okay? And you can, through an API, you can just put things all the time. You can get them, you can secure them, you can version them, whatever. So, let's say I have a box there where I store logs, admin logs, okay? So what I can do is, as logs come in here, I can trigger a lambda to evaluate the logs for errors. So a log hits there, S3 tells lambda, hey, I just got a new log, here's the, here's the link to it, do your thing. Lambda grabs that, evaluates it, looks for errors and things like that. If there's an error, then it does something. It sends you a text message, sends you an email, it shuts the system down. It turns on your sprinklers. I mean, <laughs> it depends on what you want to do with it. But that, does that answer your question? So that's kind of an admin way. Uh, or it can be if I use, if I have my front end, or I'm sorry, back end. I have, let's say I build a front end. Uh, and what are you using right now? What's your framework of choice? Angular or React? So React? Yeah. You React, guys. I'm a view guy. React is great, you know, if you're smart. But view. If you're not so smart, I use view. Anybody use view? All right, I'm gonna teach you guys view at some point. So, okay, uh, but yes. Yeah, so let's say I have a React website, okay? And my back end can be a lambda, okay? I, I put an API gateway in front of it, so I have an API that handles my like post, get things like that. So I do a get against this, and it fires a lambda. So that's more of the you know like website event. So. We'll, we'll jump into that second here. So, anybody have any other questions on this? Does this make sense? In the truest technical sense of, of serverless, something has to happen. Lambda says, I'll handle it, and it does something. Very high tech right there. Something happens, and I do something. Okay? All right. Serverless guys, does that make sense so far? Am I right? Okay. You guys like, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. All right, so let's look at an anatomy of a, of a function. Okay, this is Node. If you don't like Node, I'm sorry, that's all I know. So I could, I could do this in Python, but this is the one that I can actually answer the question. Any Node users in the thing? Oh, man, I think, okay. You raise that proudly, man, no, yeah. He's like, okay. All right, so this is Node, it's JavaScript. Most of you, who, how many of you have used JavaScript at some point? All right, so that's why we choose, because most people have at least used it. Okay. So, what you've got here, there's three main things when you look at a function. And I'm going to actually bring up a function a little bit kind of walk you through this. The first thing is we have uh, a handler. And the handler is, we, we just decided to say, this is the function I want you to trigger when the lambda is invoked. Okay? Because it needs to know, I can have a bunch of code in here, but it needs to know what to do. And you can have code outside the handler and inside the handler. But this is what I want you to do when the lambda is invoked. So that's the handler. The second thing is the event object, okay? So we talked about how serverless needs an event to happen. Well, the Lambda needs to know what happened and where it happened and who did it and all the things that come in. So that's what the event contains. The last thing is what we call the context object. And 
And this is, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's context around the event. When did it happen? What API did it hit? More like metadata about the event. That you probably use the less than the other. Well, you have to use a handler and event, but the context is helpful if you're getting into some, some specific things. So that's the anatomy of a landing. So what's happened here is, is like in this one, I'm actually uh, you know, setting up a response. And then I, all this is doing is just saying, hello world. This is an API response example, OK? All right, so let me show you this in a real world so you can kind of get an idea of what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna log back in. Anybody get an email saying their account's ready yet? Yeah. You, your account's ready? I found my old one. You found your own? <laughs> That's cheating a little bit. Nice job. Okay. All right, so we're gonna go to Lambda. Again, I'm working in the Frankfurt area, okay? So when I go down there, I'm choosing Frankfurt. So that's the region I'm working in. So I'm gonna go to my Lambda in my console. Uh, is that big enough? Can y'all see it? All right, let me know if it's too small. All right, so I have no functions right now. We're gonna create a function, and I can do this right from the dashboard. Okay, we're gonna author from scratch. I'm gonna put my Microsoft function, okay? Uh, I'm gonna do node uh, 10x, but you can see here all the other ones we talked about. All righty, and then I'm going to create the function. That's simple. Yeah, it's pretty default. I could have added some things, and we'll go back. We'll go back to that. Now, what this is doing is it's actually creating the function and the role that's, that the function needs to do some work. And right now, all that role really has is the invoke function uh, command. All right, and and the ability to write to CloudWatch. And CloudWatch is our logging system that we use. So this is the function. You can see down here. Here's my code. Okay. Now, very simple, much like you kind of saw earlier. Uh, and you can edit this code right in the dashboard. So if you want to play around with Lambda, you can edit it right in the dashboard. It's kind of fun. You'll notice I've got the index handler. I'm telling you, hey, this is the, the function I want you to trigger. And it's in the index file, and it's a function called handler. All right, so let's test this. Okay. So in order to test this, I need an event. All, but you have to have an event description. And really, mine's not reading the event, so I'm just going to send an empty event. That's I'm going to create this one. Oops, sorry. Uh, I'm going to name this uh, my uh, Luxsoft event. Okay. So now I have data to test my event with. Okay. Now I'm going to test it. And right up here, you can see the response from it. And there you go. Okay, so really kind of simple. Hello from Lambda. So now I can go down to my code and I can say hello Microsoft. Okay, and I'm going to save this and I'm going to test it. And there you go. Hello, hello Microsoft. Now, did I do any? Servers? Yes. Did I do? I heard a yes. Yes. I yes. I What's that? I think it is great service from Microsoft server. Service. Microsoft is not server. Right, it's a service. And, the, and, and yes, there are servers and servers, but I didn't have to set anything up. I did not have to set up an Apache server. I didn't have to do anything. I mean, serverless. Right, yeah, yeah, serverless. I'm saying, is there any servers? Sorry, I, I, I'm just yeah. unclear. So, yeah, so that's that's the simple idea of Lambda. Now that's not really scalable when I'm building out full full uh, applications, but this gives you an idea of what Lambda does. Okay. Any questions on this so far? Yeah. Two triggers in the real world. It could be clients calling your API. It could be. I'll show you. Yeah, you're like you're you're jumping ahead. Yeah, you want to get to the meat of it. Yes, and I, and I will be showing you. That's great. The only thing that I saw is what the test part. 
That's right. But this is not, this is the hey, the lambda works, but it's not a real world example. So yes, I'll be showing you a real world example in a little bit. Uh, okay. All right, any other questions on this? All righty. Jump back to my deck. Let's see where we are time wise here. Okay. Oh, we're good. All right. So, all right, so I'm going to talk about invoking lambdas a little more, uh, just how the lambda is invoked now. So there's several patterns uh, when we talk about invoking lambda. That, and when I say invoke, that means the event happens, so now I want the lambda to fire. Invoking is firing, is triggering. There's, there's, I use multiple words for it, so let me know if that's confusing. Um, so one thing to understand is we have an app API wrapped around our service called the Lambda API. Okay? And every time you want to talk to Lambda, you want to trigger your code, it uses the Lambda API. But there's multiple ways of getting to that. Okay? So, so just to understand that all of our services, S3, uh, and I can name a bunch of other services, use Lambda, use the API to invoke it. Uh, it's used by all of the services. Uh, it supports eight sync and async models. Uh, you can pass an event payload structure you want, so you build it up, and a client is included in every SDK. So SDK, Software Development Kit, there's a Java one, there's, there's a Python one. If I'm running direct Python uh, and I need to invoke a Lambda, I can do it from the SDK. So, so let's say I get crazy, I'm gonna go to my React guy over here, and I run the, Java, the, the JavaScript API in my client. And I don't necessarily recommend this, but it's possible. If I'm running the SDK in my client, oh, come on in. Okay. No worries, we're gonna start all over. Nice. You're good. Uh, if I'm running that client or SDK in my client, actually I can actually call the Lambda service directly if I have permissions set up properly from that client. I don't need an API gateway. I don't need an API in front of it. I can invoke the Lambda directly. Okay, probably not the way I would do it, but it is possible to do that. Feel free to sit anywhere and, and uh, yeah. All right, so that's that's how the Lambda API works. So there's three types of execution models on this to kind of understand on how throughout our ecosystem Lambda works, okay? The first one is what we call a synchronous, okay? So this kind of goes back to your question. If I use an API gateway, which is a service, that I can set up that responds to clients calling, you can set up a REST API or a WebSocket API. I can make my call, let's say I have a, a path, you know, mydomain.com forward slash order. It would hit the API gateway, it, it would then trigger the Lambda function synchronously. Okay, it means it makes the call and responds to the client. Now your code might be asynchronous. But the call, the, the call API gateway makes is to the Lambda function is a synchronous call, meaning I make the call, I wait for the response, and I respond to the client. Makes sense? Okay, yeah. The word, the word async, which is the word on the previous slide. What was it? What does async mean? All right, good question. I'll answer this next one. That's a, that's a good question. With SNS or S3, they're asynchronous patterns, and here's how that works. Meaning, I make the request to SNS or S3, and again, the SNS stands for Simple Notification Service. How many of all, how many of all of you as developers have worked with a pub sub methodology, publication subscription? Okay. The idea here, and, I, and I'm probably getting a little into the weeds, but to help you understand, what SNS does is it creates a topic. It just says, "Hey, let's have a topic. Uh, you know, I don't know, my event." Okay, or, or no, let's use something different. So I'm let's say my dance party, all right? With my dance party, I can have subscribers, and that could be people who want messages from that topic, okay? It could be, uh, it could be people with SMS, like phone, so text message. It could be email. It could be an HTTP endpoint. It could be another SMS topic, something like that. Then, when I push to that topic, so I send a publication to it, then, then, uh, then it notifies everybody, okay? So coming back to your asynchronous question, when I push a publication to SNS, I then move on. I don't care, it's, it, in my code, I don't wait for a response. I move on knowing 
Something's going to happen when we call out of band or out of, what, out of my, it'll come back to me later. Does that make sense? Kind of? So, so when you think of asynchronous, kind of synchronous behavior. Right. So, okay. So when we think of synchronous versus asynchronous, synchronous is a, what we call a blocking call. So, like a browser, it makes a call and sits and waits. Right. Okay. When we think of asynchronous, it makes the call and doesn't wait for the response. It might check for the response later. Hey, did something happen? But it doesn't wait for the response. That's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. And I have a great demo I'm going to show a little later to kind of explain that. But that helps. So with this, the same thing. With S3, what I can do is I can drop a file in a bucket, and then I don't care what happens. Okay? I drop it there, I move on. That then asynchronously triggers something to happen in Lambda. Okay? Does, does that hopefully clear that concept up? It's kind of, there's a lot of words I'm throwing at you all that kind of, especially if you're new to, to this. So. The final uh, approach we have is what's called stream or poll based. All right? So this is really good to understand when you're dealing with servers. Um, we use a service called DynamoDB, which is a database. Anybody use DynamoDB service guys? Okay. All right. Anybody else even look at it? DynamoDB, um, okay. Anybody shop on Amazon.com? All right. Probably not as popular here. I get that. In America, you're like, yes, of course, because you get everything from Amazon.com. Right? So at Amazon.com, we have a thing called Black Friday. And on Black Friday, we get traffic in the millions and billions. Okay? DynamoDB handles that load for us. Okay? It's a database that can handle stupid amounts of, of input and output very fast. Okay? And it's a NoSQL database. Anybody using NoSQL? All right, good. All right, there's something. All right, I got some NoSQL. There we go. Are you a developer? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Same here. I'm kind of. Yeah. Because okay. I know guy. Yeah. So there you go. All right. So that one to be very fast David. Uh, Kinesis streams. This is for really fast ingestion. You want to ingest a lot of stuff. Okay. So you just need high speed ingestion. Uh, and you can use Kinesis. And I'm talking, you know, uh, you know, about a thousand events per second, a minute per second of just. Fast, and you know, I know that doesn't sound very fast, but this works through shards. That's per shard. So I could have 50 shards. So I could have 50 meg per second come in. I could have 500 shards. So it's a very fast uh, ingestion of data. Okay, and how Lambda works with that is it'll pull it every second. Every second it'll say, hey, do you have new data? Hey, do you have new data? Hey, do you have new data? And it just does that constantly. Work. You don't have to write the code. It automatically does that for you by attaching it to it. So, all right. Now, I want to be clear. How many of y'all were expecting this to be an AWS day? Or were you expecting just serverless? Okay, because so I want to be clear that I'm an AWS guy. This is what I do. So, if you're here, you're like, well, this seems to all be about AWS. Yes, it does. Uh, and the reason is we start with serverless. Uh, Azure has serverless offerings, and so does GCP in the cloud. But we started. We started in 2014. We're the biggest provider of it, uh, and so that's, that's what I know. So that's what I'm in. I mean, it's on my shirt for working with companies. So I don't want you guys to think, "Wow, this is not a marketing thing." It's just these are the services that I know that we talk about how they work. So, all right. So how this works? Back to back to our asynchronous kind of thing. If you look at service architectures, one example is we can put a file into a bucket. I've talked about this quite a bit. It shoots off a lambda. We could also have data coming into Amazon SNS. Uh, another new service we have is Amazon Event Bridge. I'll show that in a minute. Uh, and that fires a, a lambda. And then this polling idea that I talked about with SQS or, S or, or Kinesis, data is pushed into SQS, and then lambda pulls it and, and clears it out for us. So these are different patterns for when we develop. And the last session that we do today, or depending on how, where your accounts are, the, the session I'll do today, I'll talk about why these patterns matter and, and how to make them work for you. All right, so one more here, a couple more uh, examples. We're using Kinesis, which I talked about earlier. Data comes in. Uh, we can use things like, these are just examples of what you might do with it. Uh, 
Anybody ever create a chatbot or know what a chatbot is? All right, good, all right. So you can create a chatbot very easily with serverless, where we actually use Amazon Lex, uh, and Amazon Lex will, will you know, power you know, Alexa, and it will do some, some voice things for you. Uh, and then uh, it fires a Lambda. And then how many of y'all, how many of you have a server that's dedicated to cron jobs? Okay, yeah. yeah you don't know, okay. I know. Okay, all right, so cron job, big deal. So what we see is a lot of people that have a server, they spin up a VM that they spin up in the cloud, and its entire job is to every five seconds do this, or every 20 seconds do this, or every five hours do this, right? You can actually do that with Lambda. With CloudWatch, Cloud Event, uh, let's try that CloudWatch Events, you can do a cron, same, same syntax you use to do cron, you can say trigger a lambda every whatever hour, two hours, three days, seven days, to do some job. And you only pay for the invocation, which if it's under that first million a month I told you about, it's free. So if you're running a server, even the smallest server in the cloud, I probably just saved you 17 to 20 bucks a month. Okay? If you're running a large server, I may have saved you two to three hundred dollars a month. Because it's a lot cheaper to just do this. And whatever you're doing in that, you can generally do from your AWS Lambda using the SDK. So the SDK will interface with all the other services on AWS, or if you call systems in your own, uh, if it has access, it can call systems that run process. Okay, that's another um, idea. Any questions? Do you have a question? Oh, I think you're raising your hand. Yes, sir. I have one question. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, hang on one second. Yeah, my hearing is really bad, just so you know, so if I come to you this one, sit here. I'm very slight, there was three months of working. It seems for uh, push more than three months. Right. It's also known as polling. Polling. Polling can stay in different ways. So it is. You're, you're right. So so let me explain that. Okay, I, I see what you're saying. So what he's saying is back on this slide here, uh, streaming and polling, you're absolutely right. What I'm saying is data that's streaming in, but the Lambda pulls the stream. There's no way three is being pulled. Right, so, so, so yeah, it's a Lambda, yeah, you're right. So we pull, P-O-L-L, -L, not P-U-L-L, -L, polling, we pull the stream for new data. So the stream, Kinesis has a massive stream that's just going through, and every time it gets new data, we can trigger a Lambda. Lambda service, and it's done in batches. So let's say I, let's say I have 300 that come into the stream. I hit it one second, I grab the first 100. And I hit it, and it's got a marker. It says, okay, we've done up to here. Then the next time, it says, all right, grab the next however. You can set the batch to 10, 20, 2, 5, whatever you want. So grab the next however after the minute. And then it, and so that's polling for new data. But it's polling on a stream-based idea where data is continuing to come in. I'm not trying to say they're the same, I'm saying that's how we work with students. Does that make sense? Okay, no, yes? Okay. A bit, okay, all right. I'm glad to try to explain more if you think that works. No, I understand the way, but it's not very really Well, okay, the data is streaming. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, okay, all right, I see what you're saying. Okay, all right. So, and I know you're saying if you're polling and there's an increment, if there's an increment, it's not truly stream. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. it's exactly right. It's on a second, it's like per second base. Uh, but that's because of the massive amounts of data coming in. So, so it's, if it's if it's not real time, it's pretty dang close. So it's within, within a second. So that's on the task. Yeah, yeah, it's a, that's a really good point. So good thing that's an excellent point. So if I needed something to do immediately when it hit. I can use like SNS and do large amounts of data coming in. SNS can automatically trigger multiple lambdas, something like that. So, so if it needed to be a little more time wise, that we can do that. All right. All right. So let's jump ahead here. Okay. So for permissions on lambdas, because we because we're big, you know, obviously security is huge. That's one of our top priorities, right? There's two things you think about. There's the function policy, which is hey. Uh, this is a, these are allowed to execute my lambda. So whatever service is triggering it has to have access to execute. Okay, and when we create the lambda in there, those permissions are generally as you if you're using the dashboard like I was showing, 
and you add like let's say a bucket as a trigger, the, the dashboard will create the role for you, but you can manage it yourself. The second thing we look at is what's called an execution role. Okay, and the execution role means what can the lambda do? Okay, does it have access to Dynamo DB? It can only read from Dynamo. No, now it can read and write. It can do different things. So the, with Lambda, the critical parts of permissions are who connects, who can invoke it, and what can it do. All right, any questions on that? All right. So where do you start? Okay. So I'm, I'm getting into service. I'm getting into Lambda. I definitely haven't explained all there is to Lambda or all there is to service to you guys today. But I want to talk to you about where do you start. We'll kind of we'll kind of show some examples or so talk about this. First thing I would tell you is start with a framework. Okay. What I mean by framework is don't try to roll your own scripts. Don't try to. You can through through the through the client. But we, there's great partner frameworks out there like Serverless Framework, Claudia, different things like that. Ours is AWS SAM, and you'll see some SAM today uh, on how to, how to work with that. But you want to start with the framework. With SAM, SAM stands for Serverless Application Model. Okay, that is it. Have you guys who've done service, have you seen SAM or heard of SAM? Okay. All right, ah, assumption. Okay, so all right, so this is kind of probably kind of new. So Sam, the entire job is Sam. How about cloud formation? We all use cloud formation. Okay, so when when I talk about cloud formation, uh, and I'm going to come back to Sam in a second. Cloud formation is the way on AWS to manage your infrastructure as code. Okay, does anybody know not know what that term means? Infrastructure as code. Does anybody know what that term means? Okay, all right, good. When I say infrastructure's code, it's like raising your hand, you do know what it is? Okay. When I say what infrastructure's code is, it means instead of me pointing and clicking and launching and doing all that stuff, I can keep a template of all the infrastructure that I need. Anybody heard of Chef or Puppet or Ansible? Okay, kind of this, all right, there we go. Kind of the same idea. Rather than you actually having some, like a book, you say, okay, now click here, now launch this one, you have recipes or you have a template that launches all your infrastructure for you. SAM is that for service, okay? With SAM, I can store all my infrastructure in a template, and I can reuse that template over and over wherever I want. Okay, so it gives us a lot of power. So if you're pointing and clicking to launch infrastructures, that's just not, that's not a scalable, reproducible way. All right. So, same template looks like this. Uh, in this particular template, this would create a function. It would create a, the, the role, which we call an uh, identity and access management role, or IAM role. It creates an API gateway and a DynamoDB table. Uh, very powerful, very quick way of doing this. So what happens is that, so these don't look exactly like the idea is you have a template, becomes architecture. Okay, it goes up to lambdas, builds up your API gateway, creates your roles, and so on. The other part of SAM is what we call CLI. Have to, uh, you all sit behind Windows machines. So how many of y'all use the command line? All right, good. All right, good. That's encouraging. All right. So uh, we have an, we have two, two command lines that we use with AWS. One is the AWS CLI, which can manage the entire thing. And the other is called the SAM CLI. And the SAM CLI does a lot of things. It allows you to develop local. So if you were sitting to yourself, thinking to yourself, and, and let's be honest, how many of y'all were thinking, all right, how do I develop servers locally if there's no servers? All right, so yeah, okay, good. And you're, you're telling the truth that. So this allows you to do that. This emulates the, our Lambda service on your local machine. Okay, and I'll show you a little bit of that later, depending on where we are in the workshop. But, uh, this allows you to say, hey, run the invoke this lambda, and here's the event data. Uh, or, hey, run this API gateway, and here's the you know, resources. So, you can also uh, look at logs, dependencies, different things like this. Uh, I encourage you to look at this website. You get a chance to look at it. Uh, it is on Amazon.com, start with Sam. All right, so, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Technically, you could. 
could. So you could spin up an API gateway and you could open it up to external connectivity, but it's slow because it runs off Docker. Yeah, and, and, but you could say, hey, test this. The thing about it is it's not going to emulate S3 or SNS or any of the terminals. Say again. Okay, yeah, so, but you technically could run that, yeah, so. If so you, I think it's some, sometimes I cannot get access to MS service, and I want to emulate a production microcentral to run it all here. Yeah, I, yeah, I wouldn't do that, not, not with this. There, there's a thing called open pods, so you can, it's not an AWS mm -hmm. thing, but you can look at doing that, which is, which is a, 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 a serverless infrastructure that you can run locally. So I can migrate from my all my servers <laughs> so to my service sites. Yeah, I don't know how much open pods, how much that open pods will do, but you can look at that. This would not be the way to go. You, you, your latency would kill you. Yeah, um, yeah, but yeah, this would not be the way to go. That's an interesting question. I've never had that before. So, all right. So here's some standard. Uh, ideas we kind of talked about. Here's some things that we see people do with um, serverless. First of all, uh, web apps. We've actually seen people run static websites from serverless. Uh, I, I don't think I would suggest that. If it's static, host it in S3 bucket. How many of you, did you know you can host a website in S3 bucket? Yeah, so no server, good. So if I have a React site that I've built, I can drop the whole thing in S3 bucket, turn on web hosting, and I instantly have a very scalable highly resilient website, okay? Only static sites, but it works great. Um, running complex websites where I'm doing server-side server, server side rendering, um, things like that. For backends, this would be if you have your React site, and this is your backend, you can get the data. Data processing, um, big time, uh, you're doing a lot of your map and use batch processing, and things like that. Do chatbots. Uh, Alexa, anybody have an Alexa? I'll be in the wrong place for that, okay. You've been heard of Alexa? Yes. Okay, good. You've heard of it. Okay, yeah, I know I'm in the wrong place for that. Uh, Alexa's powered by services. So when you use Alexa, you're hitting my landings. Not mine, but my services. Okay? And finally, IT automation, which we talked about with the cron, uh, different things like that. All right. So, I talked about API Gateway. I want you to understand what API Gateway is because we're, we're going to look at it a little more. So API Gateway is designed uh, to create a unified API front end for multiple microservices. Okay? Uh, it, it'll give you DDoS protection, throttling, it'll handle authentication and authorization, uh, and it'll do throttling, metering, uh, and you can monetize your API by using uh, you know, our dashboard for it. When I say, my, how many of y'all have familiar with microservice architecture? Okay, good, a couple of you. How many of y'all are familiar with Monolith? If you're with Microsoft, you're probably familiar with Monolith, yeah. Let me explain the difference here, just for those of you who don't know. So the old way of building an application in like a, a Node Express or Java or Python or whatever was one server, well, multiple servers, but one application that handled everything, right? Users, authentication, reporting, everything, all built into this one application, right? And so as a developer, and I've been there, I was, uh, it, it, it's where when you push code, you push the whole application every time, right? Okay, I worked for a company where we had an application that took over seven hours to deploy. They would come in on, yeah, I know exactly, it's the face you just made, was what I made every night. I was part of the deployment, and I felt sorry for those guys. They'd come in on like a Thursday night, and it would be an all night deployment, they would sit around, and this would happen, and that would happen, and the database migrations, and this, and that, and that. And, and never failed, you'd get seven hours into a nine hour deployment, and it would, it would crash, right? Okay, and so there goes Friday, because then they're, they're starting to back up, things like, that's a horrible way to do it now, please. okay? What we want to be able to do is to be able to deploy little parts of the application, what are called microservices. Okay? And with serverless, you really need to, you really get into that, that mindset because that's the way serverless lambdas work. You can do one lambda, and I have a demo for this a little later, you can do a lambda and say, handle everything, but you want to get into a microservice box. So, 
So we'll get into a little more on that, but I want to make sure you understand that when I say microservice. So when you look at an architecture, uh, this is not this, this is an example of almost everything you got gateway can do. So don't, it's probably a little overwhelming to be honest. But if you think about an architecture, a serverless architecture. With API Gateway, you look at API Gateway as kind of this middle guy, you can have private endpoints, meaning only things that your systems can hit. You can have regional, meaning just a certain area, or you can have what are called edge optimized, which means it's, it's all around the world you can hit with your, your folks are hitting edge uh, optimized. Okay? So with this, uh, you, you can your services, your websites, your mobile clients can hit it. Uh, you can handle, it can all be handled by CloudFront distribution. CloudFront is our CDN. You can like Cloudflare or Akamai, something like that. that um, this allows you to distribute all over the world. Okay. And on the back side, you can have, of course, uh, you know, you can be connected to any of your AWS services. You can also point to external sites. So let's say I want to front uh, the Yandex location services. Do they have an API? Does anybody know? Google Location Services do it as well. You have an API. I can actually take an AWS API gateway and point it at Google Location Services and give them my API address. So you can point to external as well, uh, on-premise, all kinds of things like that. So you have a lot of power uh, with API gateway. Again, the three different types we talked about are, are edge optimized, private, uh, and regional. Um, and so, depending on what you want to, on how you want to set that up. So this is kind of a, this is an example of what I was talking about on static hosting. This is a standard website you can build with servers. I can host an entire website without running a single server if I do this architecture. Okay? And here's how it works. Okay? This is one of the ways it works. There's multiple ways. Okay? So I can put, uh, my, my client's going to hit API or CloudFront, which is uh, it's a simple storage. Uh, it stores all of my CSS, JS, and images. And it's actually stored in S3, all the static site. Okay? Then it hits the API gateway, which hits my AWS Lambda, which does find me my dynamic data. Okay? Nothing is on a server. It's all serverless, and I only pay for what I need. I run a website like this for my own website. My mom and two of her friends looked at it, that's it. And, uh, but I pay, I think I pay a dollar ten a, a month, which uh, I don't know what the, the conversion rate is right now. Uh, but it, yeah, it's like 15, 15 rules. Uh -huh. So it's pretty cheap. So probably less than what you're paying to host a website. Now, granted, I'm not getting a lot of traffic, but it's, it's very cheap. Okay, and most of that's in the storage. So, because I have a lot of stuff in there. All right, so, you know what, I think we're going to skip that for right now. No, actually, we're not going to. We're going to come back to this. I'm going to do a high level on this real quick. So, one of the things as service, as uh, developers, oh, we have time, let's get we're almost there. One of the things as developers is we have to manage code, right? We have to manage dependencies. Okay, and here's one of the things that Lambda offers. And it used to be so each Lambda, remember I talked about this microservice, okay? Each Lambda is its own entity. The whole thing's put out just by itself, okay? Everything it needs, everything is all wrapped up in a zip and pushed out, okay? So let's say I have a library that I need to use on every one of my Lambdas. I have 30 Lambdas and they all use the same library. Well, I don't want to package that library and send it up. Nor, especially if it's a library that I'm maintaining, it's not one I'm just downloading, it's one I'm maintaining, I don't want to go to every one of them and update the code, right? So we have this thing called Lambda Layers. We put this out last year. And it lets functions easily share code. And so you upload, you create a layer one time. Okay? And then you that layer can be used with any number of Lambdas. It's very helpful. So when your Lambda is created or updated, it goes and gets that layer and makes it part of your, of your uh, code, okay? It's got built-in support for securing, sharing each system. So you, when you upload a layer, you can make it public. I have a public one that has all my SDKs that I like to use, okay? And I don't care who uses it. You guys can use it if you want. In fact, you will actually use it if we do the demos today. All right. So when you use a layer, again, you put all the components into the zip file, you upload as a layer, 
The layers are immutable and can be versioned. Once you put it up, you can't change it. Okay? Uh, and the reason we do that is, let's say we do have a layer, and there's a lot of third-party companies who are putting out layers that, that they want you to use. Uh, some, some companies that have third-party uh, company in, in Istanbul uh, called Tundra. They have a layer that does great uh, observability on the NDS. And so if you want to use that, you can add their layer. What if they delete that layer? If they delete the layer, it doesn't hurt you. Your functions are going to continue working. Because remember what I said is when it creates a function, it goes and gets that, makes it part of yours. But when you go to update the function or to create a new one and it's not available, you can't use it. Because they've either, let's say they stopped permission for it, or they deleted it, or they've gone to a new version and need to update the version. So, but it will never break a lambda in production. Okay? It only, you just can't continue on with it. You can reference up to five layers. And so what I tend to do is I'll say, hey, here's my main SDKs, here's my local library, here's my personal libraries, things like that. Uh, and you can run a custom runtime. Remember earlier when I said, hey, you can run your own language? That's how you do it, pop a layer. All right. The Lambda Runtime API, this again, you can Linux compatible uh, language runtime, which uh, a lot of .NET Core Linux compatible now. So you can do that uh, as well. But we already support that locally, so you don't have to do your own runtime. Um, we, we launched it with uh, Ruby uh, running that, and we've seen uh, Erlang, different things like that. Anybody use Erlang? Yeah, I, I, yeah I've used it one time because I was forced to. So, yeah. All right. Uh, all right. So, here's how it works. Uh, the bootstrap executable acts as a bridge between the runtime of HTTP API and the function to be executed. So the bootstrap needs to manage response error handling. So when you write that, you, you write in, uh, and this may, most of you are like, like, I'm never going to make a runtime API. But you never know. I never thought I was going to, and I ended up doing it. So it's kind of handy to know this. Um, so you write the, uh, the API, and then um, information on the interface endpoint and the function handler are shared as environment variables. So you create all this. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time there because that's something you probably going to do. But if you do, we've got documentation on it. All right, the other thing we're going to talk about here is orchestration of, of, your, of your application. When you're doing service microservices, anybody have any processes that they're running that have a lot of steps? And maybe your code says if then a lot, or switches, things like that. So when you run lambdas, a couple of things to know about lambdas. One, they'll only run for 15 minutes. Okay? So the longest you can run a lambda right now is 15 minutes. That may change. It used to be lower than that. <clears throat> If your lambda is running longer than 15 minutes, or if your process that you need to run, number one, you might want to evaluate the process. It might be doing something wrong. It could be broken up into steps. Number two, lambda may not be the best service for you. Container, you might look at containers, Docker, something like that. Um, anybody running containers right now? Docker, basically? All right. Um, but sometimes we have a lot of orchestration that we need to do. Uh, a great example is I, I built a payment uh, processing system for, for a company. That they need, they were using Stripe, and it needed to create subscriptions and add subscriptions and create the account. I had to do a whole bunch of stuff, and if one failed, it broke everything else and things like that. And I had, I did it all in one lambda. Wasn't proud of myself a long time ago, uh, and it was just you know lines and lines and lines of code with a bunch of if this statements in it, right? Um, not quite, but kind of. So we have a thing where instead of doing that. You can remove the redundant code. You can do that. You can do all your orchestrations through a thing called step functions. Okay. So this is also what we call state machine. Okay. When I does anybody know what I mean when I say state? When you deal with applications, you deal with state. I think most of you do that. Serverless lambdas are stateless. Okay. And what I mean is you, you don't want to expect if I if I invoke it once and I save some data in the lambda. Data's not going to be there the next time. There's no guarantee it runs the same execution environment. Uh, they're stateless apps. So you want to save state often, you know, caching or a database or something like that. That's just good practice, right? As developers, when we run microservices, that's good practice. Okay? But, but stellar functions allow you to keep state if you have a lot of orchestration to do. Okay? And so you can, each one of these green things, are a some type of service, usually a lambda invocation. It might be uh, you might be inter interacting with one of the other services, but 
But Snow Functions allows you to do serverless workflow management with zero administration. And the cool thing about it is that Snow Functions handles errors for you. So my code, I don't have to run my try catch, I don't have to do all that. If my code fails, I know through my orchestration what to do next. Okay? So for instance, I'm going to check an image. If the image is the right type, it will go store the image. If it's not, it will go to a failure. Okay? And all this is done through a JSON file that you just set up and tell it what to trigger and stuff. Great for orchestration. Now, this is a little pricier than just running a lambda. So you want to make sure what you're doing, because this can get cost costly, but it'll save you a lot of money if you're handling large orchestration uh, type processes. So for integrations, it integrates with a bunch of other, uh, other systems. Uh, I won't go through all those right now, um, as I did with Square uh, So here to give you an idea uh, of how this could work, uh, with the database lambda functions, um, you can you can run different processes. You wait, get job status. You can actually do direct service integration. So if I want to just directly uh, integrate with uh, a batch. Or SNS or SSC. So the nice thing here is sometimes you don't even need Lambda for it. It's still serverless. You can integrate directly with other services. All right. So um, the other thing we're going to talk about real quick here. Let's see where we're at. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're talking about serverless time wise. We're doing we're just about done here. Uh, I want you to look at this. The SAR. This is service application repo. I mean, you do package management. You may do npm for Node or pip for for Python or okay. Uh, Maven, different things like that. So this is kind of like a package manager for serverless applications. All right. So the idea here is, let's say I need there's a process that I run all the time, and that is I drop files in a bucket. I use uh, a system we call uh, recognition to recognize faces in the in the files, and then write out a file and write out a file on that. Uh, so if, let's say I take a picture of all you guys. And then I can do facial recognition. Okay, um, that's a process I use in a bunch of different apps. Let's say, or rather than me re-implementing that in every application, I can write a, a mini application that's a facial recognition app. Drop a file in this bucket, it fires recognition, it saves the data out, and I can actually include that app in one of my larger apps. So what you end up doing is you build a serverless application that is a grouping of multiple sub apps. Does that make, that's kind of a complex thing. Does that make sense? Anybody not following that? All right, so there's a lot you can do here with the service application repo, including a lot of stuff that people have built and made public. You can go ahead and search it. You can find, hey, I want image recognition. I don't want to write it. Here it is. Hey, I want, uh, I want image manipulation with image matching. Here it is. That kind of thing. So you can do a lot of, a lot of different things here. Let's see where we're at here. Okay, so. Metrics and logging, and in serverless, we consider metrics and logging a universal right. Uh, I've sat with companies, and, and, and okay, yes, what do you do with your logs? We store all our logs. Okay, that's great. How do you analyze them? We store all our logs. Okay, what are you doing with those? We're storing. Okay, that doesn't do us any good, does it? Just storing logs is great, but if you're not analyzing those logs to see where your failures are happening, that's bad. So we believe that, that using CloudWatch, you can build in metrics, use, and this automatically happens when you fire up a lambda. Remember when I showed you building that lambda that had CloudWatch? This automatically happens. And you can write custom data out to, to CloudWatch as well. Um, CloudWatch logs, uh, you have API gateway logging, lambda logging, uh, you can do log pivots, and you can export logs uh, for later analysis anywhere you want, also for searching. The other one we use, microservices, one of the things about microservices is now we no longer have a single app to follow the trail. We have a bunch of different things going on. So we have a service called X-Ray that allows you to look at all your microservices and see how they're working together. A little, little advanced for, for what we're talking about today, but kind of get, just put that in your head. This is an example of what a log looks like so you can get a tracing kind of showing, hey, I'm getting error on some of these, some of these are warnings, and then I can kind of drill down and start seeing what happens there. That gives you a better idea. For pricing, uh, how AWS works is we do one million requests and 4,000 gigabytes of compute every month. 
free for every customer. AWS offers a free tier for a lot of their services, but it's for the first year only, except for serverless. This is forever. Okay, always you'll get the first uh, one million requests and 400,000 gigabytes of compute for free. So the way, the way a, a Lambda is built is the invoke, the request itself, and then how much storage to use. Okay, and that's important to understand. So if you're doing a startup, anybody working for a startup? Okay, most people with enterprise type things, okay? But a lot of them, you're building internal startup like applications sometimes, okay? So a lot of these can be done for free or very close to it. Um, with ser serverless, the only knob you have to adjust is your memory. How much, well, you can do your timeout as well, but basically for, 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 for performance is your memory. Okay, and an interesting thing about this, uh, a lot of times we immediately think, hey, if I run the least amount of memory, it's going to be the cheapest, right? So we have this exercise that we run where we do, um, we, uh, stats for a lambda function that calculates a thousand times all prime numbers less than or equal to one billion, okay? So on a lambda of 128 meg of memory assigned to it, it takes 11.722965 seconds. And it costs us 0.0246 to run it. Okay. On 1024, it takes 1.465984 seconds and it costs 0.0246 to run it. Basic idea is more memory gives you 10 seconds less, so it's one tenth the, the length, so it's way faster, and it's very little bit more. Okay. So when you're when you're dealing with serverless, you want to see you got to understand your workload. Is it compute intensive? Is it memory intensive? These are things that we that we set. Uh, again, I'm not sure. Do you guys have HIPAA here or PCI? Okay, PCI you do, but yeah, well, that's that's global. HIPAA is uh, it's uh, it's not just America, but it's it's a health information. Uh, we are compliant uh, on all these services and more. All right, so the service website is at aws.amazon.com forward slash serverless, and then the same one we talked about. All right, so that's the end of that. Now, look at your faces. Some of them, um, some of you are like, ah, I'm getting this. But some of you are like, oh, okay, <laughs> what have I gotten into, and how can I sneak out? Okay, uh, to questions you might have. A lot of information, and I'll do my best to get yeah. Uh, if one lambda function pulls another lambda function, will it? You will pay for both. So for each both. one's considered an invocation. Yes. But I can reuse some for the base in my number. That's true. <laughs> That's very good. That's very true, but there's still it's considered an invocation. However, I would tell you never call a lambda from another lambda. And here's why. Never is probably a strong word. Best practice is to not to. And, and I'll show it a little bit. When you when you call one lambda from another lambda, what you're now starting to build is a monolith application. Because it's no longer microservices, because they're reliant on each other. If this lambda goes bad, and it won't if it's my code, but your code, I, I don't know. I'm just kidding. But if this lambda goes bad, now this lambda is dependent on it and broken. Instead, what I would do is put an, a queue between or a, some type of pub sub and do an async. Now, sometimes you're like, but it has to be sacred. Sometimes I need that data back. Okay. I get a Right, right. No, I know what you're saying. But that's, yeah, that's what I would do. We would put some type of pop up. And I, again, I have a demo on async as much as Makes sense. But to answer your original question, you can build or you can build both. But if it falls under that million, you're still free. So, what other questions? What are the hardware? Hardware limitations. Um, yeah. So you can, within your code, do some threading in Lambda. Generally, if you think about the way a Lambda does, if I need to generate, if I need to pop up more processes, I tend to pop up more Lambdas. Okay. So, so if I need, let's say I need to do, I have one Lambda, and I need, I have a process where I can do like seven different things. Now I can have that lambda multi-thread and start doing some stuff and do some. Or I can hit one SNS call 
and have it fan out to seven angles to do that. Now, granted, you may be saying, yeah, but that's invocation, that's going to cost them more. But it's less memory because you, you're, it's done. Because if I have one lambda that pops and goes away, and I have a million invocations, so that's going to be fairly, you know, I'll probably hit it in bigger things. It pops and goes away rather than popping up and staying and waiting and then going away. There's more cost there, which I showed, showed up there. Uh, or it's, it's about the same. So, so generally we do multi thread we say go out to multiple. What are your limitations? So, so the amount of CPUs that you have is going to be directly related to the amount of memory you choose. So if I do the most, I think it's three gig, I, I, I don't have to, I, I have to find the chart, but it's like one, one two, three vCPUs based on the memory. So it's automatically scaled based on memory. Um, your limitation as far as running, like I said, is 15 meg, uh, 15 minutes. How are you doing? 15 minutes in long you can run process. Uh, other limitations, three gig is the most memory you can add to it. Uh, uh, your as far as 75 gig is the amount of storage, the amount of storage that your lambdas can take across all your lambdas. So, um, it, it, so, so in a region, so so if I have like 40 lambdas and they equal 75 gig, that's a lot. Of so that's about all of them. So, other questions? All right, let's do this. Let's take a 15 minute break. We can't remember about 10 minutes. Yeah, no, another question. Do you have some conflict with Val? What's that? Do you have some conflict with Val about the same number? Oh, do you have some conflict? Or is it in there? Yeah, yeah. It's very similar to Val. Say again. Number same of Val. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I know. <laughs> Not legal department. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, we get that. Like, you know, that's a that's a query thing. That's a Microsoft thing. I've got a lot of things like that. Yeah, it's. I know that because we use it, we went through all the hoops and red tape to use it. But yeah, I couldn't tell you any kind of conflict. You've got. Come on, you're talking about. So, all right. Um, if there aren't any more questions, let's do let's do fifteen. Let's get some. Let's get a walk around. Get some coffee. Let's go. Yes, okay.